Um, well, welcome everyone. I appreciate you all being here today. I'm Mayor Emma Mulvaney Stanek. I'm joined by the BED Director, Darren Springer. Uh, we wanted to share a few pieces of information. I'm going to pass it over to Darren in a moment here. But I wanted to first start to uh, specifically talk about one element. Uh, there's a larger update uh, being provided to City Council. It's been a little less than a year on a critical City Council resolution they put forward regarding the McNeil uh, power plant and what comes next. Um, and I specifically just want to frame out that what we're going to share, what part of what we're going to share here today is the first um, small step towards really moving a just transition forward and the larger, uh, on the larger scale of things in terms of my vision for this city of Burlington doing concrete work related to um, be continuing to innovate and be bold on climate change. And one piece of this is to make sure we're making incremental steps forward necessary to help make a just transition for the plant. And when I talk about just transition, as I did during um, my campaign for mayor, it includes several elements. It includes thinking about, first of all, the public jobs that are involved at McNeil. Uh, as folks know, I'm a labor organizer um, in my profession before becoming mayor, and really thinking about the importance of continuity of public jobs, transition for the folks who are working and operating the plan is a big piece of a just transition. A second piece, of course, is making sure that we continue to be able to move forward um, when the right technology is available to uh, be able to move ourselves towards more fully renewable um, sources, meaning um, that we can continue to push uh, when more things come online for a small uh, public utility like BED. We are small fish in a very large ocean in terms of the larger um, grid. Uh, and then also just thinking around uh, good dialogue and process with our community to make sure that folks know where we are and what's possible right now, but that doesn't prohibit us from continuing to push and set a vision about where we're headed. So this is a very first important step that uh, Darren will be sharing around starting to make any of that possible uh, to make sure that Burlington is in the best position we can be uh, to be able to make bold moves um, when things become available to the city. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Darren Springer, General Manager of Burlington Electric Department. Um, we wanted to share a few items that we've uh, shared now with City Council, uh, one of which is a report that's related to the District Energy Resolution 7.6 from 2023, and it asked uh, several questions uh, specifically of us, of BED, of the General Manager, to report back on. Um, we did share in there some analysis that we have from a group called Prosumer Grid that's looking at what combinations of solar and storage, wind and storage, uh, wind, solar and storage would it take at what scale to replace some of the energy characteristics that McNeil delivers for us uh, in terms of its output, its uh, services to the grid, its capacity. Uh, so that analysis is in here. Definitely speaks to the idea that, that it's an order of magnitude increase, uh, even from what we have statewide today when it comes to uh, wind and storage in particular, as well as uh, depending on which combination you choose, uh, solar as well. Um, we're going to continue to be at Burlington Electric in the market for renewable energy. We're going to be looking to procure renewables. We're hoping as we grow our load through more electrification, more EVs and heat pumps and geothermal systems, electric transit buses, uh, we want to. And the new renewable energy standard update calls for us to meet more of that load with new renewables. And we think that that plus battery storage has a real uh, a real future for us at BED. We're going to continue to be in that market. Uh, that analysis is helpful. Uh, it's responsive to one of the questions that's in the uh, City Council resolution. Another aspect of the Council resolution had a very ambitious goal related to the stack emissions at McNeil, and it called for, uh, as, as much as practicable, the greatest extent practicable, uh, what could we do to cut stack emissions 25% in five years 50% in 10 years, very ambitious, while continuing to reliably operate the plant for the benefit of ratepayers. And one of the things that we've thought about in that context, and part of what we're announcing today, is that if we had full control of the plant and the site, uh, and I remind everybody we're a joint owner, we're a 50% owner of the plant uh, and the site uh, with Green Mountain Power and Vermont Public Power Supply Authority being the other two joint owners, if we had full control of the plant and the site, what could we do differently uh, in meeting some of the goals and outlined both in the resolution goals that the mayor has, that the administration has, and that BED shares uh, to improve the environmental footprint of the plant? And so when we think about it, that was something that was compelling, and we've reached out to our joint owners uh, as of last week and sent a letter inviting them to work with us on a negotiation to see if it's possible for Burlington Electric to achieve a transfer of shares and ownership of the site so that we had full control. Uh, so as of the 10th of October, 
Uh, we have a signed letter agreement uh, that we will negotiate with our joint owners exclusively for up to six months uh, with an extension possible if needed uh, to see if we can reach that type of an agreement uh, that would be good for our customers and community, good for the joint owners, uh, customers as well. And some of the things we're thinking about is if we had full control of the site and the plant, uh, how much uh, could we do? Uh, how many innovative things could we do with the site? Could we have battery storage as part of McNeil? Uh, we already have a solar test center with the University of Vermont. We already have uh, just recently a shipping container on site that is supporting uh, Intervale Farms, uh, a hydroponics operation, uh, indoor uh, agriculture that's being grown year round. You know, that's an innovative use of the site. What other things could we do there? Uh, can we implement the wood chip dryer that would bring more efficiency to the plant? And could we eventually change the operating parameters such that we could serve Burlington's needs fully while operating the plant less and having less stack emissions, less need uh, for traditional wood chip combustion, even while we're providing all the reliability and benefits that Burlington needs um, and supporting the workforce at the plant. So that's an exciting opportunity. It's something we're excited to pursue. Uh, we're pleased to be able to negotiate uh, with the joint owners on that question. Um, those negotiations, as I mentioned, could take uh, up to six months. Uh, any agreement that's reached, if one is reached, will be subject to obviously a number of public processes. That includes with our own governing bodies here in the city, the Electric Commission, the City Council. Uh, we'll also include, obviously, at the state level, the Department of Public Service and the PUC. If any agreement is reached, there will be a lot of review, a lot of public process. We'll look at all the different factors that go into that. Uh, but for us, this is an exciting and tangible and we think creative way uh, to try to reach some of the goals that we have uh, from an environmental standpoint while continuing to support uh, the workforce, continuing to provide reliable power and uh, give us uh, control of our destiny when it comes to uh, the McNeil plant and the McNeil site. And there's many, many futures uh, over the long run. Uh, and we obviously want to get to more wind, solar, hydropower, battery storage in the long run, both in Vermont and in the region. And as we do so, uh, there may be opportunities where we have different needs and we can consider those as well. Um, I do want to make crystal clear that uh, these negotiations are not an attempt to shut the plant down in any kind of immediate way at all. Uh, if we wanted to negotiate for that, we would. Um, but this is actually a negotiation to take control of the site and the plant for Burlington, for Burlington Electric, so we can pursue efficiency, we can pursue innovation, we can achieve stack emission reductions, we can achieve environmental outcomes and do so in a way that's the most cost effective as possible uh, for our customers and community. Um, why don't I go ahead and stop there, and see if we have questions that we can answer. And we do. <laughs> I also did come. Of course, I have questions. <laughs> Well, having sole control can mean a lot of things for Burlington. I think there's a lot of benefits, uh, both short, medium, long term. Uh, for the short term, as I mentioned, I think we can pursue some of the efficiency and innovation projects that we want to pursue. I think in the medium term, there might be an opportunity to change the operating parameters and cut stack emissions. And over the longer run, if we get to a point where uh, we have an abundant amount of wind, solar, hydropower, battery storage, and we don't need a resource like McNeil, uh, certainly it would give us the opportunity to make that decision more unilaterally than we could today. Um, it may be that we want to use uh, that site in the long term in a different way. You can repower these facilities, you could resize, you could have different fuels, different energy technologies. I think that that site will continue to be an important site for electric uh, generation for the foreseeable future. It's connected to Velco, connected to GMP, connected to BED. So there's a lot of potential for uh, things like battery storage at the site as well. Um, but we're not pursuing this with any sort of near-term uh, shutdown goal because we know on, from the data, if you were to shut down McNeil today or in the very near future, you're going to be shifting your reliance, unfortunately, to fossil fuels predominantly on the grid, and that's not an objective that we have in Burlington. So, and in the materials, you'll see we have a letter that we sent, and they've responded by signing on, and that's just where it stands. We haven't had deep discussions about what their future outlook is or, or what they're looking to get out of the negotiations or what their posture is, and certainly I'll leave it to them to speak for themselves. You have no sense of whether they're interested in having this conversation. They must have said They're interested in having the conversation because they signed the letter agreement, but I don't want to characterize their position.
I hope you read our filing on Friday. Okay, uh, then you know that at least uh, where, where we are with our 50% uh, share, uh, we actually would rebut very strongly that presumption that the plant is losing money for Burlington. Uh, the plant for Burlington, which is the economics I can speak to, uh, our data is showing when you add in all the value streams that we have as a utility, somewhere between a seven and $14.7 million net positive on the economics. So for us, our economics with the plant have been favorable over a 10 year period. The plant's economics go up and down, depending on a variety of factors, but I'll only speak to our economics. I can't speak to the economics for other utilities. Are you helping with our negotiating position? No, I'm just trying to understand why they might be Again, I'll, I'll dispute for us that it's losing money significantly, but I would argue that we are seeking a future for the plant that is different than the way it's been managed in the past. And we've had a joint ownership agreement for a long time uh, that's based on the way we've run the plant, you know, uh, particular operating parameters, particular types of output, and, you know, things like having Village Hydroponics have a shipping container to grow agriculture on site, having the UVM Solar Test Center looking at things like district energy, looking at battery storage, looking at the wood chip dryer. Some of these things may have some unique benefits for Burlington or Burlington's economic or environmental goals that may differ from what the joint owners are looking at for their own goals for the long run. So again, I'll let them characterize their position as they see fit, but I think uh, we are really looking to have a different future at the plant uh, than what we've had in the past. So it's timely to have that discussion. No, we've been fortunate we've been able to work through for the projects that we've done so far um, but anyone who uh, pays attention to our joint owners meetings which are public uh, knows that there sometimes can be some differences of opinion in terms of how we move forward with some of those projects it hasn't always been uh, you know everybody seeing things exactly the same way uh, we've had to work through some different things we've had good relationships with our joint owners they are good partners to us uh, but some of these projects necessarily because of the characteristics of them have a different value to Burlington and Burlington has its own unique environmental goals and climate goals uh, that the joint owners have a different you know portfolio different set of goals that they're pursuing so there may be uh, differences as we look at the future of the plant and that's why it's timely absolutely I would offer that district energy as it's been conceived, and it could be conceived of in different ways, so we're not locked into a particular way to do it, um, but you can kind of separate that from the plant itself in a lot of ways. And in fact, uh, we've always viewed them as, as kind of related but, but distinct. Um, district energy is, is, is infrastructure that can be powered by a variety of different means to provide steam to a customer so that they can get, uh, they can use less you know, fossil fuel uh, on their premises uh, or maybe multiple customers. Uh, so even as it's currently constituent, you know, there's three different sources. Uh, there's waste heat, there's steam, and then there's an electric boiler that's part of the district system as it was currently conceived. Technology is evolving pretty rapidly in this space. I'm learning about some things even in the last week uh, relative to steam and electrification that I've, I hadn't heard about previously. So I think there may be opportunities to even be further innovative with that concept. Um, but if we were to move forward in that space, which we have to come back to, we haven't had the chance to really evaluate that. Uh, you know, We need to have that land use discussion uh, with the city proceed uh, district energy. Um, there may be ways to look at it that are not distinctly tied to running the plant in a particular way for a particular period of time. And I would just add that, um, and, we, and I think this was just at the last city council meeting, maybe the one prior, we just did an extension on the, um, the time to give us uh, as the city, as a new mayor, to make sure we can be uh, continuing our negotiations to start whether the prior administration for the UVM, MO, um, UVM MC MOU, 
uh, to make sure we have enough time to really think about all of the city interests. I think it's an opportunity to think citywide around what is um, needed in the next several years. These MOUs tend to be multi multiple years, so I did not want to rush into it for a whole host of reasons um, to make sure that we are fully vetting all of our needs and making sure we're having a good, strong relationship with UVM MC before we were to sign off on anything, um, just in addition to what Dan was mentioning. Uh, and while I just have the, the mic for a minute, I just also, I didn't mention in my um, opening remarks, the other, the other piece that this really, all this work really represents in these first six months of um, our, our partnership as the new mayor and, and Darren as my director here at BED is really an opportunity to rethink how we've been doing things, to innovate. It's what I've been asking every department head. Um, it's an opportunity to take things and, re, and, and adjust based on these new, this new administration and our three primary goals, one of which is to make sure we have a comprehensive citywide climate strategy. Uh, that's really pushing and thinking creatively about what technology is coming online and what pieces do we need to sequence in order to make more possibilities possible uh, in the future um, as we think uh, going forward. And I mentioned workforce, I mentioned of course climate, but the other part about this of course, and I talk also about these, um, this in my priorities as a new mayor, is affordability and making sure that we're really starting to think about um, how do we keep payers in mind and we also think about the overall economics of course of the city but um, what I'm really hopeful about is we position ourselves differently in terms of ownership, hopefully, if this is successful, um, is that we have um, more ability to really, uh, to really be thoughtful around the integration and the full, the full decision-making power of how we leverage the entire asset known as McNeil, which is the land, the location in the Intervale, the facility itself, all the other bells and whistles that can happen, that we, we just, it takes two additional extra steps with additional owners right now. I think unfortunately that's a question we can't really answer yet until we have a sense of the parameters of what the potential negotiated agreement would be. I appreciate the question, it's something we'll definitely consider, but can't really speak to it yet. No, so we have a net zero energy uh, revenue bond, grid reliability revenue bond. Uh, we've outlined the projects that we're hoping to fund there. The bulk of them, I think 80%, are related to the electric grid and EV charging. Um, there's actually only a very small piece of it that's even related to generation, and none of it is uh, earmarked for this purpose. So please remember to vote in uh, three weeks. <laughs> and return your ballots now. Um, yeah, yes and no only because I've learned a lot more about the plant and the and what I've learned along the way of course is you have different fuel sources. My primary goal uh, when I was a candidate was to look at uh, and even back to being a state legislator is understanding biomass and the impact that has as a carbon fuel source and wanting to make sure that Burlington was moving towards um, all sorts of, of abilities to provide electricity for ratepayers, etc., without having to rely on anything that was carbon-based. And so that as an ultimate um, North Star uh, goal uh, has always been something I want to move Burlington towards. So as I've now been mayor and understanding the operational sides of McNeil and that it's the plant and that there's new technology, I, didn't, I'm not, I don't come from an, an energy background policy-wise, um, there's a lot more possibilities, some on the horizon, some not even on the horizon, around what else we can leverage that plant itself to do. The land, the asset, as I was mentioning before. Um, and it, my goal is to help move us off of a carbon-based fuel in, the, as in terms of a long-term goal. Um, my slight no is just I want about, um, or however I phrase that initial answer, around closing down McNeil as I understand a little bit more on the nuance of leveraging that public asset that we have of owning that particular, well, if we fully own it, especially at one point, how else can we leverage that, but always with a commitment to moving us to fully renewable, non-carbon-based fuel sources um, to move our city forward. So that's the nuance that I've learned now, and I wouldn't have known in its entirety, to be honest, without being mayor. So instead of close McNeil, the phrase you use now is maybe like end biomass generation of electricity. That's probably like a more, a more of an accurate piece. And the other piece I just want to emphasize is that we need to have a timeline that's realistic for all the transition points that are also very important in terms of a just transition, the jobs involved, 
um, the rate payers, of course, the affordability piece, and then, of course, understanding where our climate's at. I mean, in a, two years from now, who knows what's happening to the state of Vermont in terms of, of climate and the impact and what is available to us to pivot. And I think that's always where I want Burlington to be, is where we can we continue to innovate and be creative. And it, again, it gets a lot easier uh, in some regards when we are hopefully going to be a sole owner um, if, if this is something we can negotiate with the other owners to be able to pivot a little bit more easily. Um, you've identified being a small municipality or a small um, utility as one of the problems from for contracting for clean energy. And I'm wondering if there are any plans in the works to work with other utilities or work with public service uh, to combine utilities in order to access some of the clean energy that's um, down the road. Well, I would just say that, you know, Burlington's been a leader, even as a small utility, in procuring renewable energy. Uh, first city in the nation to be 100% renewable. Uh, we both own generation and we contract for generation. And we contract for all different types of generation. We have three different wind contracts. We have hydro, both in state and out of state. One of our hydro resources is from NIPA, which actually is a state contract. What's the kind of model I'm looking at to think about? Which, you know, is a unique historical state contract where we're able to get some hydropower from uh, NIPA. Uh, the challenge for us is if you look at what's being developed uh, in Vermont and in the region, uh, in Vermont, we are seeing no new wind generation. Uh, we're seeing uh, solar certainly in the city has grown. We have 10 megawatts of solar. We're the largest uh, solar per capita of any city east of the Mississippi, according to Environment America's Shining Cities report. Uh, and yet we know it's challenging to develop larger scale solar in the city because of our footprint. Uh, we're seeing larger solar in Vermont in some cases being proposed, but there's opposition uh, in some cases to those solar projects. For example, 20 megawatt solar projects, we've seen opposition to that. Uh, certainly no one's proposing uh, new, uh, you know, large-scale wood generation, uh, and nobody's proposing new hydro of any kind. And in fact, when we relicense the hydro, in some cases we lose hydro output, uh, both in Vermont and elsewhere. And so when we look region-wide, the only resource that's being developed of any particular scale is offshore wind. Uh, Vermont, as a small state, doesn't have the uh, benefit of being first in the queue for offshore wind and my understanding is the pricing is quite expensive at the moment uh, relative to other renewable resources. So we're in the market all the time, uh, both on our own. Uh, we are a strategic member of Vermont Public Power Supply Authority, so we have the potential to work with other municipals in the state on financing and on power uh, supply as needed. Um, the problem is we need to develop more renewables and I think everybody who cares about climate change, everybody who cares about the environment, uh, and around these questions that we're grappling with here should be doing everything they possibly can to support new renewables. Uh, and that's what our renewable policy says now in Vermont. And that's something that we support it. And we want to see it happen. And we want to be a part of it. Were you surprised at all of the numbers of new generation of solar, wind, and battery that you need to do to fully take over the volume of McNeil? I mean, I, you've said for a long time it would be massive, but were you surprised at all about the numbers there? The, the magnitude is definitely, um, it, it's, it's noteworthy. Um, you know, I think about battery storage just as one component of that. And we, when we talk about McNeil, we've talked about the idea that it's dispatchable. So for Burlington in the winter time when prices are high, we can store fuel on site, we can run generally when we need to. Um, batteries can mimic that to some extent, um, but you need quite a bit of battery uh, storage to be able to mimic that capacity. Uh, and here it was talking about somewhere between 9x and 98x of the amount total installed in Vermont, not Burlington. So it speaks to the idea that we have a lot of scaling up to do um, in technologies, and certainly we want to do our part. So as part of this conversation that we're having, uh, we outlined in the report, we see the possibility of five megawatts of battery storage right at the McNeil site. It's, as I mentioned earlier, it's electrically a very good site for that kind of project. Um, so there's great potential there. And Burlington, I think, will continue to want to do not only our part, but more than our part. Uh, in the in the effort to scale up these technologies. Um, but, you know, and going back a little bit to what Kevin was talking about, we've always said that if we can get to a point where we're relying more on wind, solar, batteries, hydro, those are the fuels on the grid that are running when McNeil's not running, that's a slam dunk conversation to have about, okay, that's the time to move away from uh, wood fuel because we don't need it, we've got these other resources, but we have the job of helping to scale those up. 
and to take all the steps we can to improve and be innovative and efficient uh, in the interim. And the one thing we don't want to do is go backwards to fossil fuels. Um, we already are over-reliant as a region on natural gas. Uh, we see price spikes in the winter when there's not enough gas, when the region's turning to oil and coal. Um, so we don't want to go back to being uh, having our economics in Burlington tied to global commodities that we have no control over and see double and triple digit rate increases like utilities in our neighboring states did the last time natural gas prices spiked. And on that graphic, why wasn't hydro included? Why was it only wind, solar, and battery? I mean, frankly, we don't see any new hydro being developed. Um, so we were really looking at, f at sources that we think of as being potentially able to be developed in New England or in the region. Yeah. We still like hydro. We still try to purchase hydro every time we can. Can you expand on that a little bit? I mean, I would think that there might be some opportunities to expand hydroelectric capacity in the state. In some places, I know there's regular efforts to pull down dams, but those are usually dams that are derelict dams that are not. I mean, why couldn't some existing hydroelectric facilities be either heightened or new turbines be added? Or what's the regulatory environment where yeah, I mean, I can speak to, we're going through relicensing with our Winooski One Hydro, which is an important facility for us. And, you know, it's an expensive and lengthy process with FERC that we're, uh, we're, we're moving through there. I know, if I'm remembering correctly, like in Morrisville, uh, they had a four or five megawatt hydro that I think in the process of trying to relicense, they decided it was not going to be able to move forward. So we're losing, I think, four or five megawatts of hydro there. Um, I don't think that there's appetite in Vermont for additional uh, hydro from Canada. Um, and in fact, there's competition for that hydro in New York and Massachusetts and elsewhere. So I don't see uh, a lot of potential for us to be purchasing additional hydro from Canada. We're not necessarily looking to do that. We, uh, we don't have a huge amount of uh, hydro from Canada in our portfolio relative to um, the rest of the state. And, you know, there could be incremental improvements, I think, in certain aspects uh, with hydro. We've seen smaller, uh, very, very small hydro come online. You know, I'm talking 500 kW or, you know, very, very limited projects. But um, the momentum seems to be exactly as you said, that we're in some cases removing dams, in some cases we're decommissioning. So we're not seeing opportunities uh, realistically to buy new hydro. Um, what we are seeing in some cases is existing hydro may be available. We signed a contract uh, with uh, hydro uh, from Connecticut for a year and a half. Uh, we were replacing hydro that we had previously uh, from Great River Hydro, which is in Vermont. So there's some existing hydro that you can sometimes purchase, but there isn't a lot of new hydro development. So as a region, we have a serious challenge if we want to make our climate goals. We need a lot of additional solar and wind and battery storage because those are the things that we're committed uh, to building, I think. Can you speak a little bit more to the lack of appetite for power from HQ um, that you perceive? Because the governor speaks a lot about feeling as though the state could tap more electricity from Quebec. What I've seen, at least, and we have, I think, on a given year, we might have 10 or 15 percent of our powers coming from HQ as part of a state, you know, back to that question, a state process that led a number of the utilities to procure power, and that runs through 2038. Um, so whether or not we would want to add to our exposure is one material question, whether that's economically the right decision or not. Um, but the second piece is what I've seen is there's a lot of competition uh, in some of the bigger states, uh, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, for that hydro. And there are a lot of transmission proposals that are being developed and, and vetted uh, to bring, you know, significant scale of hydro uh, down, some of them through Lake Champlain, uh, down to those uh, states that are to the south of us in large part or population centers that are to the south of us. Um, so there's some conversations about, you know, can you have, I think there's been even conferences about, can we have more two-way connections with Quebec where there's some hydro coming during times of need in New England and there's some renewables that are being dispatched here that could go into Canada. So there may be opportunities for partnership, um, but I'm not aware of, and uh, you know, us as a utility that's in the market for resources at our scale, I'm not aware of material opportunities for us to purchase additional HQ at the moment. And I know that just like there's opposition to 20 megawatt solar, as there's been opposition to wind, as there's been opposition to wood, I know there are some who feel strongly about, you know, buying additional large-scale hydro, and there may have concerns about that, too. Yeah, I'm aware of, but what's, can you say the first part again, where you don't think there's opportunities to buy? I'm not aware of a market opportunity for us right now. I mean, we have the Highgate converter that provides a certain amount of power to Vermont, um, but, you know, if you were going to get additional power, uh, you know, none of those transmission lines are, are talking about connecting to Vermont and serving our grid. 
So we don't have. I mean, potentially there could be a conversation around that. that. That involves many more players than just us. We're very small fish, as the mayor said, in that kind of conversation. So we would certainly engage if there was a conversation around that. And I do see opportunities for two-way power dispatch between uh, our neighbors in Quebec and, and not only Vermont, but New England, because as we have more variable renewables, there may be opportunities to kind of leverage those in different ways. But you know, when we go into the market, um, when we're looking at what power is available, it tends to be existing hydro and in some cases wind. Thank you. Yeah. I think we're like Nemo. <laughs> we're Nemo. I just want to say we're Nemo. We're not less any small fish, just to be clear. We have kids. We're a good small make, fish. i got to make sure you all smile at some point during this. You know. I don't know if I'd characterize it exactly that way, uh, Charlie, but I, I would say, kind of back to Catherine's question, we can't quite characterize what the cost would be because we haven't negotiated that. Um, but in fairness, um, and I want to be transparent about this, I think there will be some cost if we want to achieve some of the environmental outcomes that we have uh, for the plant. Um, if you were to, for example, uh, change the operating parameters such that you're putting less output, less energy generation, in order to achieve some of the stack emission reductions uh, that might be something that our community wants to achieve, then you're going to have less throughput, essentially, with relatively similar fixed costs. Um, so that, that could be a challenge from a cost standpoint, and we would have ways to mitigate that, certainly. And in times of higher prices, there certainly might be more reward if we're able to run the plant fully for Burlington's benefit, as opposed to half for Burlington and half uh, for the joint owners. But these are all the types of considerations and complexities that would go into this type of conversation, and it would necess you know, be a necessity to have uh, thought as part of the agreement to those. But there's never, um, you know, there's never been a thought in, in our mind that you, know, you can achieve all of the outcomes we want with you know, zero cost. There's going to be uh, some potential cost pressures that we will have a uh, challenge to mitigate, and we will mitigate them uh, as best we can. But if our community says, we want to achieve those stack emissions reductions, that's important to us from an air quality standpoint, from a climate change standpoint, uh, we want to achieve that. So we want to run the plant less um, and have still some of the reliability benefits, the energy benefits, the jobs benefits, um, that's something we want to look at. We're, we're public power utility. We want to be responsive to um, the various changing needs that we may have as a community. And I would just simply add that we, as a city, when we have core values and goals we want to advance, and that includes things like affordability, equity, um, doing the right thing. I think of an analogy of our livable wage standards, for example. We could go with the cheapest option. That's not always in line with our values. We have a livable wage floor, for example, and all the contracting we do as the city. And so that obviously costs more than, say, something that was you know, paying minimum wage. And so by extension, the ultimate goal here is to make sure that we're in a position where we can leverage um, things we want to advance, be it climate-based, labor-based, whatever that might be for um, the future of the plant, um, from a place where we can pivot uh, much more easily. And so if that costs a little bit more, um, that, that allows us to have a more values-aligned future for the plant and what our ultimate goals for climate are. And I have five more minutes that I can be here, and then I have to go talk about buses. So. <laughs> So just to be clear, and I want to just point out, our two guests here are also intervener litigants in a docket with us at the PUC, um, so I just want to make that reference. Um, I think that what we're talking about is near, medium, and long term. And when I was talking about the idea that uh, maybe there could be different fuels, um, I was talking about it in the context of 
over the long run, if we repower the facility, resize the facility, reshape it, uh, bring in new generation mm -hmm. technologies, those could take a variety of different shapes. Those could be that uh, you, know, you reduce the size of the facility and add more modern generation technologies. It could be that it's more efficiency. It could be that it's thermal uh, as well as electricity, which has a much different uh, carbon profile, I think, than electric only. Uh, it could be that there are different fuels, and we're definitely interested in those to explore those. We have an RFP out uh, that was approved by the City Council uh, to bring in a third party to look at some of those questions. But I think we also agree that in the near term, if you were to move to any other resource that would mimic McNeil without the solar, wind, and battery storage that we were just talking about, you'd be moving to fossil fuels, um, and that's not something we want to do. So that's a part of the long-term exploration. It's part of the RFP, um, but it's not something that is available to us at this moment in time. No, so I think what you're referring to are the joint owner's financial reports that are reported at the joint owner's meetings. We do not have audited financials specifically for McNeil, and one nuance, just one of many, that we've pointed out in our rebuttal filing that I'll point out here, is we don't have insight into what rec values, for example, the joint owners get from the sale of renewable credits from their share of McNeil. So those joint owner statements include an assumption, doubling essentially whatever BED gets, for the joint owners. But there are assumptions built into those. We don't have audited financials presented at those meetings. Those are estimates using those types of assumptions. What we presented in the rebuttal filing takes all of that data that you're referencing, runs through the various value streams that we as a utility, we're not a power plant company, we're a utility. We run through all the value streams that we have, and I do, in that context, fully disagree with the idea that the plant is losing money because six out of 10 years under that analysis, it was net positive. Cumulatively, it was net positive by somewhere between seven and 14.7 million. And it operates in such a way that it's also an insurance policy against market volatility. So as I mentioned, I think in, a, in, in Vermont Digger, uh, even if it was not positive economically and it was only moderately uh, negative, it would still have value in the utility context by providing a, a hedge, so to speak, against volatile markets. I'm just trying to get a sense of whether any of the joint owners are suffering losses, financial losses, from the plant's operations of me. I can, all the other benefits that the plant, you know, enjoy, you know, grants to jobs and forests and not having to spend money in other ways of procuring electricity, but whether the joint owners are losing money on McNeil. And as a way to, for a reader to understand why they might be enticed to maybe get out from being a joint owner. I can only speak to BED's economics, and we've presented the data that those are positive, so I won't speak to the joint owner's economics. I don't have those insights. Okay, okay friends. I have to go talk about buses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.